Hi, I'm James J. Welcome to week 10. This is your general commentary. And uh, what I'll do today is I'm going to start off with uh, an Antonio Machado poem that was in the Steve Cowett reading from last week. And uh, I'll continue to talk about our poetry section that we're getting into, our third and final uh, section of the course. And I'll go through that reading, with the Steve Cowett reading, I think in a little more detail than usual, just because this is a key transition uh, essay for us. And uh, then also, of course, take care of some general housekeeping and uh, an overview of what we've, uh, what we've done, where we're at, and where we're going. So uh, if you've got your, uh, your module handouts uh, from the other week handy, I'm going to just start with that Antonio Machado poem that kicks things off there, the Memory from Childhood poem. A chilly and overcast afternoon of winter. The students are studying. Steady boredom of raindrops across the window panes. It is the schoolroom and a poster. Cain is shown running away and Abel dead, not far from a red spot. The teacher, with a voice husky and hollow, is thundering. He is an old man, badly dressed, withered and dried up, who is holding a book in his hand. And the whole child's choir is singing its lesson. One thousand times one hundred is one hundred thousand. One hundred, or one thousand times one thousand is one million. A chilly and overcast afternoon of winter. The students are studying steady boredom of raindrops across the window panes. Antonio Machado, great Spanish poet from the 20th century. Um, also, the translator is, is interesting. You know, Robert Bly, we started out the semester with uh, reading uh, some poems by Robert Bly. So, uh, so yeah, a little connection there. And... Uh, I think it's worthwhile to think about with this, what, with that module and what we were reading with the Steve Callot, how similar it is um, to what we've been up to. And I say that with, with a couple of things in mind. Uh, in mind. Um, one, when this poetry section, oftentimes uh, students, if they're not uh, used to writing poetry, not familiar with poetry, they can get quite a bit of trepidations in this third section. And so the nice thing, I think, with this essay and why I selected this to go in this particular spot in the semester is it, uh, it ties into a lot of the writing, uh, the narrative writing techniques that we've been using so far. So that there are a lot of things that Cowett uh, talks about that should seem pretty familiar to you. And you can say, oh yeah, I know what he means there. I know what he's talking about. And he's transferring those similar skills into poetry skills. And because really they're overall, they're just, they're aspects of quality writing, regardless whether it's fiction, nonfiction, or poetry. So I think hopefully that will be useful uh, for someone who, who hasn't written much poetry before and may not quite know what they're getting into for this last part. And also if, if folks are, um, are poets and this is their main thing, this might be the thing you were looking forward to, I think that he goes into enough detail that it's definitely useful for you, if, even if you've written quite a few poems, that uh, what, he, what he has to say is good, concrete, specific advice. So I really, I really like, like uh, Steve Callot as a teacher and a writer of uh, of of how of how to sort of the how to uh, of write poetry. I, I think he does a great job of, of communicating that. I think part of it's it's he's a gen, genuinely or was a genuinely sincere teacher of poetry. So hopefully that will will work out. So I'm going to scroll through uh, through some some more of this Cowett uh, reading again. If you have your module handy, I'll uh, from last week and those those little handouts you can refer to that. But I'm going to kind of just uh, um, go through, gloss through these uh, first couple of pages and, and uh, show you what I mean by those connections to what we've been up to. So uh, after that, uh, that terrific Machado poem, uh, po uh, poems are often generated by memories that haunt us, he says. Memories that suddenly return out of the blue are memories that are familiar companions and part of the fabric of our lives. Memories that are too precious and sweet not to be recorded or that are so painful they cry out to be exercised. Antonio Machado, one of the great Spanish poets of the 20th century, evokes not just the dullness of his childhood classroom, but something too of the magic in which even unpleasant memories of the past are likely to be draped. Something to think about, right? He's, he's contending that we, that we have all these memories, and they're, of course they're just fragments and parts and pieces. We don't have memories that are full-fledged out stories, not most of us anyway, right? It's just parts and pieces, things that come to us um, that uh, that might do just in the course of a day when there's a little minute to, from the routine to think and kind of daydream and lollygag a little bit, memories come back to you. Of course, you think of uh, you know the time right when we wake up from sleep or, or as we're going to bed, our mind kind of drifts off. We get all sorts of memories uh, that occur to us. So these memories comes in, uh, come in parts and pieces. 
and uh, Cal would say this is a potential a potentially good source for your writing. And of course, these memories aren't complete, right? They're just little fragments. And it's up to us as writers to figure out well, what are we going to do with it, with that memory? So we can imagine in that uh, Antonio Machado poem, where it just has that sort of um, small little memory uh, from childhood. And of course, this um, this could be potentially um, you know something he's overheard. Maybe this isn't even his particular memory for the sake for the sake of poetry. The uh, first person, the I, isn't uh, isn't always the same. That was on the one of the quiz uh, quiz questions from at the beginning of the module, and so that sometimes this could be something that he's overheard or this or that. But I imagine the thing if I was if I if I look at the Antonio Machado poem and say what's the memory that got uh, Machado going writing this poem? I bet you it was the part where um, they have the choir of the lessons, how the students are reciting that. 1,000 times 100 is, you know, that, that type of stuff. Um, I'm sure because it has that audio component, and I'm sure that I, I have those sort of memories from childhood where we just kind of the rote memorization where you repeat after me, you repeat after me, that type of thing, that over and over kind of monotonous style of learning. I'm sure that's what got things going. Now, of course, he, he uh, you know, it, it could have been there's a little poster of uh, Cain and Abel. It's a weird uh, kind of surreal uh, poster to have that sort of biblical... Um, uh, image in the in the in that classroom that stands out too, and that's and suggests all sorts of things, but maybe that was the thing that triggered that um, poem for him and got it got it going for him. Um, but whether it was the poster, whether it was the sounds, the repetition, of the sounds, whatever it is, he selected just a few things. Maybe it was the the voice because the voice of the teacher is is becomes key in there, right? So maybe there's a few things, but he's just selected little memory shards, little memory fragments. And he's put them to get uh, put them together. And of course, he does so with in a chilly, overcast afternoon, right? Not every day. Um, if you think about the past, it was was raining. But sometimes we think about our past. Um, you know, we think about these things. It always seems like a memory always has a certain kind of weather association with it, even though we know logically that's not true. Um, but yeah, just so, something to think about as far as the origins and how these things going, and how we shape, get going, and how we shape these memories. So I'm, I'm just going to keep uh, kind of glossing through. Um, through the uh, text with Cal, hang with me there. Um, the poem is not uh, is not filled with generalized phrases such as school days long ago, Bible pictures, and inclement weather. Right? Those are the that the, the gen, those general sort of phrases that wouldn't mean much, right? But it is particular. Uh, but it's a particular day. So he sets it. That's one of the strategies, right? He sets the memory on a particular day. The weather is chilly and overcast. There are raindrops across the window panes. As we, right, we can, that's much more uh, visual, right, in particular. There's not simply some poster on the wall, but a particular poster on the wall, one that is briefly, and it is quick, quick, right? It's the precision. It's not, he doesn't talk about the poster for seven, eight, 12 lines. Uh, that would be overdoing it probably, right? But it's precise, right? Uh, but it's briefly and evocatively described. The old teacher is sketched and quickly with specific details. He has a husky and hollow voice. He is withered and badly dressed. He is holding a book in his hand. Just a few details, but they, they bring that image uh, of that teacher alive in our mind, right? The students are not stim simply studying their lessons, but are studying particular lessons, one that the reader hears them reciting. Um, concrete sensory details such as these allow readers to form a vivid picture in their minds of what is being described. That's key, right? Those concrete sensory details. We've been talking about that um, um, throughout the semester, right? The idea of showing the particulars as opposed to summarizing and telling the gen uh, the generalities. So it's the same sort of concept we've been up to in our prose writing, we're going to be up to in our poetry writing. And uh, in Kautzis, and that's how our scene's brought to life, right? doesn't matter if it's poetry, doesn't matter if it's fiction or, or nonfiction. He says, he goes on, Notice how simple the poem is. Neither the vocabulary nor the phrasing is all that complex or unusual. If you had imagined... Uh, that poetry required an exotic or dramatic subject matter, this poem should convince you that the most commonplace experience can be transformed into powerful writing. Right? So it's how we transform these memories. Uh, the memories of themselves don't mean anything, right? It's what you do with them as a writer um, that make them mean something. I think that's incredibly powerful as a writer. That's something that you can take these memories from the past and you can shape them into whatever you like. They don't have any inherent meaning and to you as a writer applies that meaning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of scroll down a little bit to the other poem that was in there. Um, Power by Corinne Hales. It's the one where uh, 
where the uh, the two kids, the sister and brother, um, put a stuffed uh, you know they stuff a kid's shirt, put it on the train tracks, and uh, get the conductor to screech the train to a halt, thinking he's about to, he's killed a child when in fact it's just a stuffed kind of dummy scarecrow that they put up there. They wanted to see if they could stop the train, right? So it's more of a uh, more of a call narrative poem that's got it has more of a story uh, to it. But at the same time, it still has that, all those sort of elements of suspense and details and specifics. So I'm going to get Corinne Hales and think about that when th when comparing that to uh, comparing that to Machado. We're describing one scene, right? So he's describing one scene. That's one strategy. Here's more of a kind of quick little narrative um, where basically, if you are to summarize this as a, as a story, it might be summarized. A couple of kids decide they want to stop a train. They stuff uh, it's a red shirt. They stuff. Uh, a red shirt um, with some straw, put it out on the tracks. It looks like a kid's laying on the tracks. The conductor is coming by, thinks he uh, thinks a kid's laying on the tracks, slams on the train brakes, um, hits it, and then of course he gets out, realizes that the conductor gets out, realizes it's a uh, it's a hoax, and then is uh, you know of course uh, you know sobbing, weeping, thinking he killed a child, and uh, that sort of in that sort of lasting memory, right? So there's a Quick, simple little uh, series of events, but powerfully written about and directly. Power. No one we knew had ever stopped a train. Of course, that's a great opening, right? This is something, too, that we think about as far as something compelling, interesting, uh, you know, compelling title, interesting opener to hook you in. This is all things we've been doing. No one we knew uh, had ever stopped a train. Hardly daring to breathe, I waited belly down with my brother in the dry ditch. So quickly, let's know who the two characters, right? The sister and the brother. Watching through the green thickness of grass and willows. So that's her perspective. The poem gets down low, right? Stuffed with crumpled newspapers, the shirt and pants looked real enough, stretched across the rails. Okay, now we got the, the this is the hijinks, right? I felt my heart beating against the cool ground and the terrible long screech of the trains breaking began. We had done it. Then it was in front of us, a hundred iron wheels tearing like time into red flannel and denim, shredding the child we had made until it finally stopped. It's just such a haunting. I mean, we, 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 we as the reader at this point, we know that the hoax from the previous stanza, right, the previous group of lines, we know that it's a hoax, but it's, it's vividly written about and not too terribly long, right, but it's precise. My brother jabbed at me, pointed down the tracks. A man had climbed out of the engine was running in our direction, waving his arms, screaming like he would kill us, whoever we were. Then, very close to the spot where we hid, he stomped and cursed at the rags and papers scattered over the gravel from our joke. I tried to remember which of us that red shirt had belonged to. But morning seemed too long ago, and the man was falling, sobbing to his knees. I couldn't stop watching. My brother lay next to me, his hands covering his ears, his face pressed tight to the ground. That's Corinne Hales. That's just absolutely phenomenal. And that, uh, just that little bit of uh, detail, precise detail, that we get such a powerful story once they realize the effect they'd had on this man of him you know, sobbing, completely falling apart from thinking that he'd you know, killed a child. Um, and uh, yeah, and it's interesting that the, the Corinne Hales, at least the speaker of this, this, this poem, is watching the man and this, this terrible thing that they've done, playing this joke, and the brother conversely can't bear watching his covering his covering his ears, his face down to the ground. We feel all those details uh, very specifically. It makes for such an incredibly powerful poem. So it's a short, relatively sh uh, you know, short uh, narrative poem that uh, just communicates such incredible power, a power in such a uh, small amount of space. Of this, uh, Callot continues to write: both Machado and Hales have told their stories with simplicity. And clarity. The belief that good poetry is necessarily dense and obscure is a misconception. To the contrary, lucidity is almost always a great virtue in writing. We'd rather be uh, clear than overwritten, uh, adopting some sort of uh, fake personas from which to write. Rather, I think it's important to be clear and precise. Many inexperienced poets also imagine that langu the language of poetry must be ultra romantic and theatrical. But a poetry which is too richly embellished with hyperventilated language, inflated sentiments, and obtrusive verbiage is in grave danger of sounding 
artificial or just plain foolish, right? P people will know if it's, if it's something's contrived and you're trying to overstate something. Um, I think that, I think they'll get the, the, the that will unfortunately come through. Um, rather, I think that precision and using your own uh, your own uh, your own voice to your best of your skills and your abilities, your own honest voice, I think transfers uh, in, onto the page much better. Hale's poem is written our, in our real language, one is that a, the one that approximates the way we speak. She finds no need to resort to a heroic, poetic, or overblown style. And this comes back to something I was saying with the creative nonfiction section, when you introduce the first person, the I, into your writing, especially in that creative nonfiction section that we just were uh, covering a few weeks ago. It's something that you have to think about as a writer, right? The, that first person, when you... When you uh, when you start writing about that, whether it be in creative nonfiction or if you use it in poetry, whatever the, whatever the style, it's something that it's not always a given that the first person is you, right? It's a rhetorical strategy. It's a it's a strategy of a writer in order to engage a reader. So um, that's something I think to uh, to keep in mind. If if I were to kind of scroll through a little bit longer on that next page, um, that's direct uh, directly addressed by Cowett in that little section called narrator and author where he writes, it is useful to remember that when poets or fiction writers seem to be speaking of their own experiences, we cannot take for granted that they are really being autobiographical. For all we know, the story Hales has told is simply a fiction, a story that she made up. It's possible. It seems like it. It's, it, sure, it sure seems like it happens, but it's entirely possible. Or it could have been something she overheard, right? Couldn't it? Maybe it wasn't her and her brother. Maybe there were 10 kids there. Um, but for the sake of the poem, you make it simpler because you don't want to have to describe 10 other children. Um, so that uh, you make it simpler and just having the brother and sister the contrast between one that can't stop looking and the other one that can't stand to look that's a power that's powerful there may have been two other uh, siblings there we, we don't particularly know about the events and for the purposes of the poem it doesn't matter those sort of things are not what's what's entirely relevant the main thing is right something that's striking engaging and that gets the reader to, to complete the rest of that poem that is to say that gets the reader to to um, to to imagine whatever sort of things they they've done in the past that maybe from the practical joke side something that like went wrong something that was unintended uh, consequences whatever whatever that might be uh, or you know from a time you you can the thing i love about with any poem you can jump in any in any given line and get that certain perspective or feeling so you might read through that poem with the stopping the train that poem power and really feel um, the perspective of the of the uh, first person, the spe the speaker of that uh, poem, and the pulling a gag that goes goes astray, goes wrong. You might feel the the uh, power, uh, or you might or you might feel the the point of view of the uh, conductor who has thought he's killed a child, is you know, and is uh, realizes it's a prank. Is it that sort of the emotional complexity of being around some something like that? Been sort of the victim, the receiving side of some sort of prank like that. Um, also, just the loss of a child. It, it, it gets us going in any of the sort of things I think of it as far as being a, being a, you know, I've, I've been re reading this poem for a lot of years. And uh, this poem is very different to uh, having kids and that type of thing now than, um, than when I first read it. I didn't have kids. And I think about, oh my goodness, the I, I relate to that conductor from hearing that sense of like, uh, just that sick, sickening feeling of, uh, you know, thinking that the, there's been a terrible accident and then that anger when you realize there hasn't been an accident you've been a, you've been part of a practical joke and then just the sense of just relief and just that sobbing and, and it's just so incredibly t t uh, there's so much going on in this poem and the key of this great Cor Corinne uh, Hale's poem is that she writes with a, that precision and allows us as the reader to complete with our own uh, experience um, to complete what's going on uh, with the poem so absolutely uh, powerful stuff and it's and in some ways it's it's both um you know a great poem like that i, I admire the craft of so, someone uh, writing a, a great poem like that and the overall effect but when i'm starting to look at that i, I can look at those also as a, as a strategy as a writer too like how does she pull that off how does she get so much done so incredibly quickly and uh I mean that's I mean that's the key as writers, right? When we look at these things, they're they're enjoyable in their own way to read, but they're also at the same time you want to kind of figure out uh, how they do it. It's like a it's like a you know a magic trick, like a you know, magician type of thing. You want to be fooled and you want to enjoy the uh, the magic. At the same time, if if uh, you too want to be a magician, 
you'd want to start uh, figuring out uh, how does that work? Uh, how are the how are the details? How they how they pull that off? So, um, yeah, let me see. I had my machine just timed out and paused. So let me get re-logged in to make sure that uh, we're recording here. Sorry about the delay. I think okay. I think we're back. All right. Um, so this point, uh, I'm I'm always I, I you know I've I've, I've used this. Uh, I've taught. Uh, that Corinne Hale's poem probably, oh, I don't know, do, dozens of uh, uh, dozens and dozens of different times, and uh, it still it just magically holds up for me. It's just incredibly powerful. So I mean that's the, that's the thing with poetry. We should be reading it aloud. Something we've already talked about as far as as a revision tool for our pros so that we want to read it aloud and let our ear help out, right? Um, but poetry should be read aloud. It should be read multiple times. It should hold up to being read multiple times. And the key is all the things that we've been talking about, all the different uh, writing strategies that, uh, that we've uh, talked about. Let me find my spot again. My machine timed me out and got me reworking here. Okay. So, uh, yeah, uh, Corinne, so that uh, kind of scrolling through. Now, I like Calix's style, too. If he presents a poem, talks about it, gets a few uh, craft elements, goes on to the next poem. Because to some extent, just to read a series of of, uh, hype, uh, of uh, theoretical ideas on how to write a poem, even if it's really well written, it can still get dull and monotonous. Um, it can feel like it's some sort of. I feel like we're in uh, Antonio Machado's classroom, where it's kind of over and over again the same sort of routine. But uh, I like how he moves in and out. Does a, gives a few examples, gives a couple of poems, a couple of examples, that type of thing. The uh, Last one in that module that uh, you read for the, for this week was uh, uh, from Dorian Lau, and it was the Tooth Fairy, and that's another uh, more uh, uh, narrative uh, narrative poem. That is to say, it's a poem that's telling a, a story that spans over several scenes, right? So we had the first, um, so the first, uh, or I'm sorry, going back to the Korean Hales, that second poem I talked about, that was all set largely in one scene. It's got a story as far as and it has that sort of elements of suspense where they're setting up the prank and how that prank uh, goes so poorly for him, um, but it's all set in one scene. Uh, one of the strategies Dorian La strategies Dorian Lau uses with the tooth fairy is she has the 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 memory that the childhood memory of uh, losing a tooth and uh, the sort of um, tooth uh, the parents together uh, coming up with a little kind of glitter and like imagine the tooth fairy um, delivering the present uh, uh, under the pillow kind of kind of thing that old. Um, idea, but of course the the history with the, with uh, the with the uh, parents and uh, with the speaker of the poem is much more serious and much more violent. As far as it's a, it's a story of domestic violence, it's a story of divorce, and uh, there's a whole lot going on in in here. And what she does with multiple with these multiple scenes that are set over a long period of time and are being reflected back upon as a memory might be reflected back upon. She uses this notion of the tooth fairy, this stray memory in the middle of all this violence, this stray memory of a, of a really sweet, genuinely sweet thing that the parents pulled off together um, to make this sort of little magical moment of the tooth fairy come and um, happen for the kid. And so that begins the poem and it ends the poem so that it's fr so that we have this framework of the, of the memory. And then in between, she moves through um, and just powerfully written details of a lot of a lot of a lot of, a lot of this more uh, serious uh, violence that occurs, and at the same time, um, I think with that framing, I think that it, it it allows us as the reader to see things from several different perspectives um, throughout the poem, so, so that it's um, well, I think it's I think it's an incredible powerful strategy. Dorian Lau is one of my uh, favorite poets and writes a lot of these more narrative poems. But it does so in ways that aren't just straightforward, so that you feel like you can get into the, you can get into the poem. So with this, uh, for example, with this uh, tooth fairy poem, it's easy enough to kind of figure out the situation. Okay, so the kids lost a tooth, and the parents do an elaborate uh, uh, little uh, kind of ceremony to set up uh, that the tooth fairies come and visited, and uh, I mean it's fairly straightforward. Then we get so much more going on. So I'll take this too. The Tooth Fairy. They brushed a quarter with glue and glitter, slipped it in on bare feet, 
and without waking me painted rows of delicate gold footprints on my sheets with a love so quiet I can still hear it. And that is just phenomenal. What a phenomenal opening, right? Now that memory in itself doesn't have any particular context, right? And then we're going to get a shift with that next stanza. Incidentally, as, as far as a, a group of lines, of, of poetic lines, it's called a stanza. So if we have a group of sentences in prose, it's called a paragraph. And a group of lines in poetry is called a stanza. My mother must have been a beauty then, sitting at the kitchen table with him, a warm breeze lifting her embroidered curtains, waiting for me to fall asleep. It's harder to believe the years that followed, the palms curled into fists, a floor of broken dishes, her chain smoking through long silences, him punching holes in his walls. I can still remember her print dresses, his checkered taxi, the day I found her in the closet with a paring knife, the night he kicked my sister in the ribs. He lives alone in Oregon now, dying slowly of a rare bone disease, his face stippled gray, his ankles clotted beneath wool socks. She's a nurse on the graveyard shift, comes home mornings and calls me, drinks her dark beer and goes to bed. And I still wonder how they did it, slipped that quarter under my pillow, made those perfect footprints. Wherever, whenever I visit, I ask again, I don't know, she says, rocking, closing her eyes. We were as surprised as you. That's such a phenomenal poem. As far as thinking on that strategy handling, uh, such an inc incredibly difficult, um, just uh, an incredibly difficult and powerful overall childhood, and framing it with a certain memory. And in, in some ways, I think incredibly uh, empowering for the writer, for Dorian Lau, to take that, those memories and put them under her control. I think, I think it's just phenomenal um, what she does in that poem in so many different uh, levels. So I think it's something, too, to think about as far as different strategies as writers, that the memories themselves have no inherent meaning. You as the writer are in control of those, uh, of those meanings. So I'm going to scroll through. It's hard to... It's such a good poem, too. I kind of want to linger, but, you know, just having five minutes of us all lingering, looking at the video probably isn't very useful. So I will speed it, speed it along. But normally I would... I would want to read that and linger on it and read it again. That's another poem that I've gone to many, many times and it still holds up. I'm going to scroll, scroll through a little bit farther onto that. Uh, the next one of the quiz questions um, was the gentle art of lying, where he brings that part up. It's the uh, it's on uh, what would be page 15 on those little on the, the sheets if you look at the bottom there. And it's the second end in paragraph where he says, The gentle art of lying. Well, Machado... Hales and Lao wish to do is to tell the truth. Not necessarily the literal truth. These guys aren't journalists. They're not uh, um, filmmakers, as far as it, you know, documentary filmmakers, uh, but the emotional truth, right? If power is autobiographical, it is perfectly possible that the author has not told the story precisely as it happened. A poet often takes a memory and after beginning to shape it into a poem, finds certain details needed to be changed or invented. As I mentioned before, there might have been multiple kids and they were involved in that uh, little prank uh, on the train conductor but uh, but if for the sake of the poem you're not going to include everybody this isn't a roll call or report so you could add take things away i think that's an, as important as a as a poet to consider that there's sort of the notion of the poetic um uh, people say ah oh, the poetic truth that type of thing i think it's not that someone's being uh, deceptive it's just that there are only certain we're, we're, what uh, what a poet's trying to do is trying to evoke the same sort of emotional experience as, as, um, as what their as what their story or what their poem is trying to convey, so that, um, so that in inhales with that story, if she'd have gone gotten bogged down writing a paragraph worth of background information describing a whole bunch of this and that, um, you know, it would have taken away from that power. I think, and, and uh, in fact, I think that he um, that there's that little section um, where he even makes kind of he writes a little. Um, a little mock area of like what that could be summarized and how it would uh, work he, when he says, uh, I'm kind of scrolling back a little bit there, but uh, uh, if, if he were to, if, if Corinne Hales were to write, one day my brother and I managed to stop a train by putting a fake person made out of different stuff on the railroad tracks. We watched the train come to a stop and then some guy got out and he was very angry. That wouldn't, uh, that, that would be a description of what happened too. Not nearly as powerful as that poem, right? So it doesn't that, that that description tells 
the events that happen, right, or show versus tell kind of idea. But it doesn't allow the reader to experience that, right? I read that and I think, okay, that's there you go. But what do I do with that, right? I'm not engaged with something like that. That poem I'm engaged with even on the 10th, 20th, 30th, uh, 30th reading. So rhetorically at this point, I'd say, does that all make sense? Because um, I'm used to, again, teaching like in a regular sort of classroom where we're back and forth. Um, but I'm, I'm going to turn that over to you to think about and consider a little bit longer. You can always email me uh, uh, questions about those concepts. Um, that sort of thing, but that's what we're, uh, yeah, that's what we're looking at with some of those things. Um, the main thing I wanted to uh, go through here is to reassure you that you'll all do very well based on what I've been seeing, um, seeing before with um, with your right with your writing skills and what we've been up to in this class. Everything we've been working on applies to poetry as well. In fact, it might apply to poetry even more so because you have f uh, in general you have fewer words and a smaller amount of precise uh, and a smaller amount of space in order to be precise. So um, one of the things too that uh, I'll do as far as setting this up, thinking about next semester, or next semester, next week um, and uh, our next assignments is, uh, um, is talk a little bit about line breaks. So that's the technical part of writing a poem. So when I hold this up onto the page and you look at that, uh, you can look over here and you can see very clearly uh, oh, this uh, this uh, oh I got it. Uh, you can see which side is the uh, the poem and which side is the prose, right? So I got my little notes there um, as well. But uh, when you look when you look at something on the page, you look at this, you can say let me get that where you can read it. So uh, uh, memory from childhood, you can see that's very clearly the poem. The poem is on the side uh, the side under that number two, right? And the prose part, writing about it, is on the other side, right? Uh, how do we know that? It's the line breaks, right? So uh, poems are are constructed in lines, so that um, so that they don't necessarily just go um, on and and, and break, uh, and kind of flip to the end of the page at, at random based on the size the size of a uh, of the uh, book. You can imagine if this were a very large book. I'll go back to putting my examples there. Um, if this were a gigantic book. Um, and, you know, went out over here. Those lines would continue through on prose. It's uh, the editor and uh, the person who knew layout and design has decided where each one of those sections uh, end. But with poetry, it always ends at, at the line. If the poet has decided, when they say a chilly and overcast afternoon, that's the line. That's the end of the line. Machado's decided that it wasn't a matter of formatting, right? And then the next line, that second line of winter, the students. He set up that break. Incidentally, that's an enjammed line. The word enjammed means that when there's, uh, you continue to run through uh, where there would normally be a grammatical break or pause in the way that we speak. And if you run the line on through that, uh, that has a certain effect. Generally, it gets you reading through the poem a little faster and kind of looking forward. Um, as opposed to the opposite, that would be an in-stopped line. So uh, so when thinking about in stop, that's when there's a natural pause to the uh to the uh, end of the line that we'd normally, whether the line ended there or not, we'd probably pause. So the beginning of power when Corinne Hales writes, no, uh, no one we knew had ever stopped a train. And there's a period right there. It's the end of the line. That would be in stopped, right? That's, that's how we, that's how we'd normally pause regardless whether there's a poem or not. Heart, and then the next line, hardly daring to breathe. I waited. Okay. Now that is an in jam line, right? So after wait, waited, there's normally we say waited for, for what? Right, and our eye scrolls down to see what I wait. Uh, I waited, belly down. Oh, okay, this is how, not, not a what, but how. So you can change that. I waited, belly down with my brother, and then in a ditch. So there's a combination of back and forth between in, in natural um, in stop lines and in jammed lines that run through. And I know I'm kind of covering that quickly, and it's a little bit uh, hazy the way that I'm, I'm, I'm bouncing around covering that. Um, so to to uh, to add more detail to that. What uh, the reading assignment is going to be for this coming up week will be specifically on uh, on uh, uh, lines and how to construct the lines, theories and ideas. And whether you want to stop at natural pauses, whether you want to jam your lines and kind of flow through, how to make uh, a person read the poem faster, slower, more methodically. Um, if you want to emphasize more action, there's all sorts of strategies for that. I'm reaching for my notes. So... That's going to be a will continue with Steve Cowett. I'm going to take this uh, great book that's in, uh, in the palm of your hand, and uh, I'll include in the module for this week 
what's going to be pages 170 to 178. So about eight pages worth of reading on blind breaks. And there are several different strategies that, uh, that Cowett employs. And it's kind of, it's not even a complete chapter on how he does that. So I, I'm just trying to, I want to get the most functional stuff for our purposes and kind of get the most efficient use of our time. So that it's just taken taken out from that. If you're if you're really interested in that, uh, as I mentioned, it's from the, that book in the palm of your hand. It's from a longer chapter on line breaks, and there's all kinds of good stuff and theories and ideas too. But I think for our purposes, that'll give us some ideas that we'll start thinking about whether we want to end stop our lines at natural pauses, or whether we want to try to enjam our lines and flow them through. That's that that'll be what we're gonna. That that's. That's the kind of the, the first places for us to step into the world of writing poetry. So that'll be the writing assignment um, for the coming up week. And we'll continue in that same vein. And Cowett, like I said, he's um, some of these things I think can be somewhat daunting as far as, you know, when you say theories of how to break a line of, po of, of poetry. And I don't know if that sounds all that great necessarily so as far as something to 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 think about and ponder and consider. But the way that Cowett des uh, describes it, I think that he does bring those those things to life in a pretty nice way. So let me scroll through my uh, notes and see if we got that covered okay. If, uh, we got a few things to hit, so it's a little bit longer um, video than, than s some of them have been. We kind of go back and forth. I'll do those mini lectures to supplement. But I like to give you enough space. I, I don't like to make the videos too long in that... Uh, it's easy to lose track of things, and if you do go back to refer to things, I like having those mini lectures where you can pull out little parts and pieces um, of those as well. So uh, I'm going to scroll through at this point um, to, yeah, what, what I think I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about um, about your upcoming uh, uh, writing assignment. So that the next thing that we have uh, coming up, and that will be November 5th, will be the first... Uh, will be the first uh, uh, poetry assignment, and it will be your overall formal assignment number five. It's going to be writing a poem in the manner of a poem you've read. So we're in, in the influence, uh, you know, under the influence of another uh, poem or another poet. And uh, yeah, for this one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I'll, I'll have that uh, assignments written, but I'm going to kind of, I'm going to scroll through this and kind of give you the uh, kind of shorthand of it so you can kind of get a feel for what we'll be up to. And uh, so for that next assignment, we're going to, uh, I'm asking you to craft an original poem that's somehow been influenced, influenced by the careful reading of, uh, of another poet, you know, another poem. So that, uh, you know, recently we covered, uh, what, last week, like Joy Harjo, uh, Antonio Machado, Corinne Hales, and Dorian Lau were all in the reading uh, for this week as well. Um, so we've got a few uh, poems and poets that you can refer to. But one of the things we've been doing is throughout the, uh, uh, the semester, is I think almost every week I may have skipped one, but almost every week we've uh, been starting with a with a poem and a poet to kick things off for us, and uh, so any of those folks can be people that you can scroll back to and you can go check those out, and uh, and uh, you know so so in some ways I think we, we've been up to a lot of this throughout the semester kind of stealthily I, I think that those things were foreshadowing what we'd be up to you know, starting now and here we are in week ten and uh, so that it was so that we didn't uh, have that. Uh, um, that real kind of sudden transition to get into poetry. We've been kind of fiddling with that throughout the semester. So what I'd like you to do for this next assignment is to go back to either one of those recent poems or either find any of those other modules if there were particular, if there was the, the Robert Bly poem that you really uh, enjoyed or if there, if there was, um, um, you know, any of the, the uh, I think we did Kim, Kim Adonisio or any of those other um, poets. May, uh, if, if, you, if you think, oh, that's the one I really want to check out. What I'd like you to do is go um, and select one of those uh, poems and then read it aloud to yourself. Oh, probably several, several times. You probably read, uh, probably already read it a couple times. But read it out loud. Let your ear get involved in the process, right? Read that thing aloud and uh, really get to know the, that uh, poem quite a bit. And pick, like I said, pick something you really like because I want you to re read through it at least a half a dozen times. And then from there... Look at that thing, not just as a fan of the poem, but as a writer, as a poet, and consider how does this how does this uh, poem work? How's this thing functioning? What are some of the strategies that it's up to? How's it using metaphor? How's it using image? How's it using concre concrete, specific details? All those type of things. You know, how's the, how's this poem uh, functioning? Then, 
sit down and start writing your own poem, right? So while you're under the influence of that poem, you don't have to sound exactly like that person. And in fact, I don't want you imitating that person necessarily as far as doing like a parody or parroting what the person is say, saying. I still want it to be your own poem in your own vision, your own ideas, your own uh, style, your own way of writing. But I want it to be after you've really considered something you admire. So you're kind of in, under the influence of that uh, poet for at least for a little bit, right? Maybe you get a first draft down. Don't even worry about uh, line breaks to start with. You can always add those in later and fiddle and move those around. As I said, that'll be the assignment for the for uh, uh, the reading assignment for this coming up week. So, uh, uh, but to get things started, start uh, just writing down on the page. Get things uh, down. Get working with uh, uh, the words. Get the language out of your head where it's completely useless in your head. Get it onto the page where you can now shape and work it and uh, start crafting. Okay, like uh, I think some of the analogies we used before is um, the idea of the, either being a sculptor. Or almost, uh, you know, like you got to have the clay. You have to have the stuff to function and work with. It doesn't, just having it in your mind doesn't necessarily help. So get the stuff down on the page where you can start working with it and crafting it. Okay. Um, also, I would discourage you from trying to ha trying to steer the poem too closely in any particular direction. Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, what I mean is... If you, you might have, say, a certain memory, because that's an idea where you, where you might uh, you know, have a certain memory or something that you've read this poem quite a bit and you've got a, you know, your own mind, your own memories that, you're, that uh, you think, oh, I think I want to write about this. So this poem makes me want to write about something from the past. It doesn't have to necessarily be your own past, um, but that's a good resource to tap, right? So I think it's worthwhile to get that thing down on the page, start shaping it, and then from there, surprise yourself. Okay, don't try to steer that thing um, too much either way. I think that um, if you start using that uh, concrete, precise details, start using your your own uh, your own skills as a writer. Think about your own voice. Um, see what happens. Let yourself be surprised. Uh, we've talked about that before, right? In when we were looking at some of our techniques for uh, for fiction, let yourself be surprised. See where it goes. Okay. Uh, some particulars on that. Uh, for the sake of clarity, uh, writing in, in uh, complete grammatical sentences, I know that there's a whole method of, of style as far as with poetry, as far as not using certain standard capitalizations or grammatical, uh, uh, grammatical uh, uh, devices. Th that's perfectly fine. Um, we could teach a whole uh, semester on that, and, and I do, uh, as far as talking about different strategies. Um, for our purposes, let's use conventional grammar. And then we can start figuring out as far as E.E. E. Cummings and all those sort of stuff, people that kind of came up with their own um, uh, methods of doing things. Let, let's worry about that at another, uh, if, you go, if you go on to take poetry classes, that type of thing. Uh, but for our purposes, for the sake of clarity, let's just continue to write in regular old grammatical um, sent, uh, sentences. You'll still have your line breaks and you'll still work with those. But uh, use, let's use standard uh, punctuation for now. Um, sometimes people will center justify poems and there's no point in doing that. Just, um, keep, keep your, uh, you know, lines, you know, you know, start them like how you would regularly. Don't need to center justify it. It looks funny. It's kind of harder to read. Um, also please don't rhyme your poems. Even if you end up with an example that has uh, quite a bit of rhyming. Again, that's a whole nother, uh, section. I've, in, I, I've enjoyed teaching classes on forms and standard, uh, uh, um, you know, you know, as far as sonnets and, and, uh, villanelles and all sorts of things that use regular rhyme schemes and uh, repetition and uh, those are a blast um, but that's a whole nother project um, so uh, don't worry about rhyming the end of your uh, in, in the end of your lines um, that'll that's that's a whole nother project um, use regular line breaks there's such a thing as a prose poem i've mentioned before that doesn't use line breaks for our purposes let's work on the line breaks uh, come up with a great title that's something we've been doing throughout uh, relate uh, related to that that's what you do to to get your reader kind of hooked and uh, going. Um, read your poems multiple times, especially as you're going through the kind of, I don't know, maybe three quarters of the way through the poem. Start reading that thing aloud. All right? Let your ear get involved so that you're thinking about your way of speaking, but in a little more crafted, polished way, right? So it's still your voice. You don't want to compromise your voice, but it's under the influence of the different poetics and strategies of a poem that you've really gotten into your head and that you're, that's... Uh, and uh, it's, it's hopefully informing your own writing in a pretty interesting way. So uh, um, let's see. So read that thing aloud. And it's, you know, it's good to get used to getting your voice out there like that. And then do remember to revise, proofread. Um, you know, make sure you got a good clean copy for me. That thing's due November 5th. Uh, email that over to me and uh, I'll get you some comments on there. Along those lines, as we're moving towards kind of the wrap-up wrap housekeeping part, 
I do. Um, I have uh, paper four from you, the nonfiction. I'm still. I just have gone through my first reading where I've read every uh, all of them together from everyone, and I'll start putting together the specific comments for uh, for for everybody. Those uh, those were uh, they're good papers overall. I think that uh, there were a lot of people that had some trepidations and had quite you know quite a few notes with the emails coming in uh, along the lines of I don't know I didn't feel well confident with this one. That's probably good. That means you're trying something new. Um, but there wasn't anything that I, uh, that dramatically made me think, oh my goodness, we're way off base. Uh, a lot of stuff to to work with there, and I'll get those particular comments uh, to you. Oh, you know, throughout the throughout the week, I'll have those uh, back to you. And um, yeah, and I think that takes care of some of our um, particulars like that. I'd mentioned in my I got a little mini lecture on uh, strategies that. Uh, as far as some strat uh, some strategies for how to finish up this course and the semester, so I'll have that in a little mini lecture strategy. The main thing I would say is that we're a good chunk of the way through the semester, or over the halfway point. Um, we're not quite to that finish line yet, so don't start sprinting for the finish line. Um, keep taking I take it one week at a time. Keep uh, keep knocking out your assignments, whether in here or other classes. And uh, when it's time to get near that uh, finish line, when you can when you can see it, and, I, and you should start sprinting. I'll let you know. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, I hope uh, I hope you uh, you enjoy these uh, these poems we've read, and I hope you enjoy what we're up to next. Okay. Bye bye.